introduction and uh, thank you everyone for, for joining this morning. It's uh, both kind of nice and slightly disorienting to be on another platform than, than, than Zoom or Yitzi uh, for a change. Um, and uh, well, I hope uh, I'm able to, to, to navigate this all uh, correctly. Um, the power structures uh, that are underlying centuries of exploitation uh, by one group of another are, are still here. Besides that we, in fact, uh, in reality, still have over 60 colonized territories around the world, maintained by eight countries, though the UN General Assembly would disagree with that number. Colonization has taken on many different forms, including in and through technology. What does this mean for our societies? What would it look like if things were different? How do we get there? Or how do you decolonize society? How do you decolonize technology? And how do you decolonize digital rights? I will start this talk with a spoiler. I will not be able to provide you with an answer to these fundamental questions. What I will try to do in the next half hour is tell you something about the problems that we at the Digital Freedom Fund are seeing in Europe when it comes to digital rights and what is often euphemistically referred to as diversity and inclusion. I will also tell you about what we're trying to do to set in motion a process to fundamentally change the power structures in the field that works on protecting our human rights in the digital context, the digital rights field. But before we get there, we first need to take a look at what the problem is and why we have it. Today's conference is centered around championing socially responsible AI. But what does that mean? From a human rights perspective, many AI-related digital rights conversations tend to focus on the right to privacy and data protection. In doing so, these conversations often miss the full extent of the social impact that new technologies can have on human rights. And this is one of the reasons why it is so important that we decolonize the digital rights space and encourage an intersectional approach to AI and human rights issues. Let me illustrate some of the issues in the context of the themes of this conference, starting with health tech. The implications of health tech on individuals is a prominent conversation at the moment as we are facing the COVID-19 pandemic. Big data solutionism is pervading coronavirus responses across the globe, with contact tracing, symptom checking, and immunity password apps being rolled out at rapid speed. These technologies are often not properly tried and tested, and it's clear that privacy and data protection often has not been front and center of those developing the technology, let alone other human rights considerations. They also illustrate the degree to which our technology and the way we deploy it is colonized. The UK, for example, launched a test and trace system in England and Wales in May this year, without, it later admitted, having properly conducted a data protection impact assessment. This admission came after the NGO Open Rights Group had threatened legal action. The heavily criticized app was abandoned, and since late September, a new one is available, which addresses some of the privacy concerns that were previously raised. But is privacy the only issue we should be looking at when considering the viability of using tracing apps to combat a public health emergency? Limiting our analysis to privacy and data protection alone results in blind spots on many of the broader issues at play, such as discrimination and access to healthcare. I'll give a few examples. To be able to download and use the app, you need to have a relatively new phone with the right operating system installed. That means that those who are unable to afford or don't have direct access to technology are excluded. There is also an assumption that each user would be uniquely linked to a phone. And of course, in order to download the app and receive warning and notifications, you will have to be online. To put it simply, the effectiveness of the app is based on an assumption that the average person in society is the exclusive own owner of a new smartphone with reliable access to the internet. Researchers at Oxford University have estimated that more than half the population of the country would need to make use of a tracing app in order for it to be effective. This raises the question, what happens to the less than half of the rest of the population that does not or cannot make use of the app? And how does the automation of disease control affect their vulnerability? Should we want to use an app at all if it's not effective for the protection of everyone in our society? Concerns about, around health data, however, are not new to the COVID-19 context. 
the UN Special Rapporteur on Privacy has recognized that medical data is of high value for purposes such as social security, labor, and business. This means that stakeholders, such as insurance companies and employers, have a considerable interest in health-related data. Many health services are built on the values of trust and confidentiality. But as more and more actors move into the health data space, these values are fading more and more out of focus. A failure to protect health data can engage the rights to life, social protection, healthcare, work, and non-discrimination. Very concretely, it may deter individuals from seeking diagnosis or treatment, which in turn undermines efforts to prevent the spread of, say, a pandemic. The access that home, home office immigration office officials are given to check entitlement to health services as part of the UK's hostile environment uh, policy is a clear example of this. But even in so-called lower, uh, lower risk settings, a person might think twice about getting medical help if the potential repercussions of sensitive health information ending up in unwanted hands are sufficiently great. It is said that health cannot be bought, but with that wisdom in mind, let us turn to the second conference theme, which is FinTech. Here too, with the ever increasing automation of financial services, it's not only the right to privacy that's under threat. Access to financial services, such as banking and lending, can be a decisive factor in an individual's ability to pursue their economic and social well-being. Access to credit helps marginalized communities exercise their economic, social, and cultural rights. Mohamed Yunus, social entrepreneur and Nobel Peace Prize winner, has gone so far as saying that access to credit should be a human right in and of itself. He said, a homeless person should have the same right as a rich person to go to a bank and ask for a loan, depending on what case they present. In reality, automation in the financial sector often polices, discriminates, and excludes, thereby threatening the rise to non-discrimination, association, assembly, and expression. Individuals may not want to associate with certain groups or express themselves in certain ways for fear of how it will impact their creditworthiness. This policing, discrimination, and exclusion can also have an impact on the right to work, to an adequate standard of living, and the right to education. Cathy O'Neill has noted that creditworthiness has become an all too easy stand-in for other virtues. It's not just used as a proxy for responsibility and quote-unquote smart decisions, it's also a proxy for wealth. Wealth, in turn, is highly correlated with race. While the fintech narrative is that it works with quote-unquote unbiased scoring algorithms that are blind to characteristics such as gender, class, and ethnicity, research shows a different picture. Many of these modern algorithms make their decisions based on historic data and decision patterns, which has led to the coining of the term weblining, to show how existing discriminatory practices that were operationalized in the US in the 1930s with the practice of redlining to keep African-American families from moving into white neighborhoods are now replicated in new technology. Those who can afford it can hire consultants or go live in certain neighborhoods to boost their credit scores. And in the meantime, those living in poverty are refused loans, often on a discriminatory basis, and even targeted because of their credit scores for payday loans and other online advertisements that can plunge them further into poverty. This illustrates that it's more than a question of privacy, it's a question of livelihood. And it doesn't stop there. Credit scores are even used to make decisions about a person outside of the financial services sector, such as hiring or promoting individuals at work. Conversely, other proxies are increasingly being used as stand-ins for creditworthiness. O'Neill has explained how this can contribute to a dangerous poverty cycle. With data sets recording nearly every aspect of our lives, and these data points being relied on to make decisions on us as employees, consumers, and clients, we are being labeled as targets or dispensables. Our occupations, our preoccupations, our salaries, property values, and purchase histories result in us being labeled as lazy, worthless, unreliable, or a risk. And that label can carry across many different aspects of our lives. Finally, smart cities. I will be brief about smart cities because I actually don't think that the question of making cities smarter through technology 
is worth having unless we are talking about the need to completely reinvent the urban design that has historically and systematically harmed people of color, people living in poverty, people with disabilities, and marginalized groups. Smart city design runs the risk of automating and embedding assumptions of how we run and manage cities that are less about people and more about profit and exclusion, as well as vague, often unsubstantiated notions of efficiency. Smart city initiatives in India have led to mass, uh, to mass forced evictions. In the United States, the question should be asked, is smart city design to reduce neighborhood crime? Isn't a euphemism for increased surveillance with all the racialized policing that comes with it? The really interesting question here is how we can use uh, AI to actually help fix these inequalities and harms. But that is not usually the focus of many of the current smart city debates. So why do we have this problem? We just looked at some of the manifestations of the problem of colonized technology. So what causes us to have this problem in the first place? First, there's a common and incorrect assumption that technology is neutral. However, the apps, algorithms, and services we design ingrain choices made by its creators. It replicates their preferences, their perceptions of what the average user is, what this average user would want or should want to do with the technology. Their design choices are based on the designer's worldview and therefore also mirrors it. As someone said to me the other day, an algorithm is just an opinion in code. When those designers are predominantly male, privileged, able-bodied, cisgender, and white, and their views and opinions are being encoded, this poses serious problems for the rest of us. And this relates to the second cause, which is that Silicon Valley has a notorious programmer problem. When you look at any graph reflecting the makeup of Silicon Valley, where most of our technology here in Europe comes from, and this is a problem in and of itself, as technology developed from a wide Western perspective is deployed around the world, this is easily visible. For professions such as analysts, designers, and engineers, the numbers for Asian, Latina, and Black women decrease as role seniority increases, often to the point that they literally become invisible on the graph because their numbers are so small. An analysis of 177 Silicon Valley companies by investigative journalists and website Reveal showed that 10 large technology companies in Silicon Valley did not employ a single black woman in 2018. Three had no black employees at all, and six did not have a single female executive. We should make it less surprising that, for example, facial recognition software built by those companies is predominantly good at recognizing white male faces. However, a predominantly male, white, and able-bodied workforce is not the only thing that factors into technological discrimination. A third cause, which we already touched upon in the context of fintech, is that technology is built and trained on data that can already reflect systemic bias or discrimination. If you then use those data to develop and train new software, it's not surprising that this software will be geared towards replicating those historical data. Technology based on data from a racist, sexist, classist, and ableist system will provide outcomes that reflect that racism, sexism, classism, and ableism. Unless a conscious effort is made to get the system to make different choices, systems built on such data will replicate the historical preferences it has been fed. Finally, we don't work consistently with interdisciplinary design teams. Engineers will build technology to certain specifications, and those will have systemic biases baked into them as well. You can have all the non-male, non-white, non-ableist engineers you can think of, but it will not be up to them alone to solve the systemic problems. If society is sexist, racist, and ableist, so will the AI it develops be. It is unhelpful to focus on the technology alone, as it negates the political and societal systems in which it is developed and operates. An interdisciplinary approach in developing AI systems is therefore crucial. There's a role for social scientists and others at crucial stages of the design and decision-making process. Developing suitable AI is not just a task for engineers and programmers. Now, what can we do about this? We obviously have a large scale problem on our hands and the monster we created won't easily be put back in its cage. 
There are, however, a number of things we can do, both in the short term and in the longer term. First, we can push for moratoriums on new technologies and until we understand their social impact, particularly on human rights. The call for a ban of, uh, on the use of facial recognition technology has gained more traction following the Black Lives Matter protests, with several tech giants putting on hold at least a part of their products in this area. This should be a guiding principle. Unless we know and understand in full what the human rights impact of new technology is, it should not be developed or used. We also need, and this is my second point, to have the debate on where to draw the so-called red lines on where AI technology should not be used at all. This conversation needs to be people-centered. The individuals and communities whose rights are most likely to be violated by AI are those whose perspectives are most needed to make sure the red lines, the, the red lines around AI are drawn in the right places. Third, when we analyze the impact of new technologies, this needs to be done from an intersectional perspective, and not only on how it affects privacy and data protection. As we saw earlier, breaches of privacy are often at the root of other human rights violations. Companies and governments need to be held accountable for these violations, and they need to work with multidisciplinary teams that include social scientists, academics, activists, campaigners, technologists, and others, to prevent violations from occurring in the first place. This work also needs to be done closely and consistently with affected groups and individuals to understand the full impact of AI-driven technologies. Then we also need to push for enforcement and compliance with existing legislation protecting human rights. There's often a call for new regulation, but this seems to conveniently forget that we already have an existing international and national framework that set clear standards on how human rights should be respected, protected, and fulfilled. This is also a healthy antidote to the fuzzy ethics debate that companies would like us to have, instead of focusing on how their practices can be made to adhere to human rights standards. And finally, we need to not only decolonize the tech industry, we also need to decolonize the digital rights field. The individuals and institutions that are working to protect our human rights in a digital context clearly do not reflect the composition of our societies. This leaves us with a watchdog that has too many blind spots to properly serve its function for all the communities it is supposed to look out for. At the outset, I referred to diversity and inclusion as a euphemism. I did that because it's not enough to make the change that needs to happen. Instead of focusing on TOCO's representation, which essentially treats the current status of the field as a pipeline problem, we need to change the field on a structural level. We need to change its systems and its power structures. And this is something that's fundamentally different from including those with disabilities from racialized groups, the LGBTQI plus community, and other marginalized groups in the existing flawed ecosystem. And here we return to the big question that was raised at the beginning of this talk, how do you decolonize a field? The task of reimagining and rebuilding the digital rights field is clearly enormous, especially since digital rights cover the scope of all human rights and therefore permeate all aspects of society, the field does not exist in isolation. We can therefore also not solve any of these issues in isolation either. There are many moving parts, many of which are beyond our reach to tackle even if we at the Digital Freedom Fund are working with a wonderful partner in this European Digital Rights, also known as EDRI. But we need to start somewhere, and we need to get the process started with urgency, as technological developments will continue at a rapid pace, and we need a proper watchdog to fight for our rights in the process. So what have we done so far? We started earlier this year with the process of listening and learning. Over the past months, we have had conversations with over 30 individuals and organizations that we are currently not seeing in the room for conversations about digital rights in Europe. We asked about their experience working on digital rights, what their experience has been working with digital rights organizations, and what a decolonized digital rights field might look like and what it might achieve. We also started collecting and reading literature about decolonizing technology in other fields, to start developing a possible joint vision we can work towards. As these conversations continue, 
we are starting similar conversations with the digital rights field to learn what their experience has been working on racial and social justice issues, working with partners in this field, and also what their vision of a decolonized digital rights field might be. Our next step is an online meeting in December of this year to first of all, connect different stakeholders, and second, receive input on what the next step in the process, which we are referring to as a design phase, should look like. The design phase, which we hope to start next year, should be a multi-stakeholder effort to come to a proposal for a multi-year robust program to initiate a structural decolonizing process for the field. Much has changed since we first started talking about the need to decolonize the digital rights sector two years ago. The recent international Black Lives Matter protests have done a lot to boost awareness about systemic racism. Is on the one hand encouraging, and on the other hand, the threat of decoloniality becoming yet another buzzword that people like to use but not practice looms large. And also, the irony of our work now being of interest to many the media, policymakers, funders now that it has been validated because the white gaze became captivated by racial justice protests amid the boredom of a, local, of, of a global lockdown, is also not lost on me. That being said, the current mood does illustrate how necessary this work is, not only in the digital rights space, but everywhere in our society. And the more of these processes we can set in motion, the better a world we will be creating for all of us. Thank you, and I look forward to the conversation.